four brain regions. Okay, let's take a look at this guy. This is a sagittal section of the brain here. I'm going to use a blue highlighter to roughly outline uh, one of these cerebral hemispheres that we can see on this section. So this is like the frontal lobe, and then you can see just a hint of the temporal lobe on the far side in the way I've drawn this. And this would be the occipital lobe and the parietal lobe. And then uh, you can kind of go up and around uh, the corpus callosum, which separates the two cerebral hemispheres, and then you've got um, roughly an outline of one of the cerebral hemispheres. And so there's a region of the brain called the cerebrum, and it's composed of uh, two hemispheres. They're separated by dura mater, which is a really tough connective tissue, and the cerebrum is responsible for most of the things that you think about when you think, what does my brain do? For example, learning and memory. Those things go hand in hand, don't they? It would be fantastic if we could learn whatever we wanted, but it would suck if we couldn't remember any of it. So really, what is learning but somehow consolidating information that meant something to you? So not surprisingly, right along with that goes emotions. Because the best way to learn something is to care about it, to have emotions about it. On the flip side of that, someone that goes through a very serious trauma, um, they're going to remember that forever, but it was because of negative emotions. Post-traumatic stress um, has roots like that in the brain. Okay, and then how about problem solving? This is a different part of learning. In our class, I present a lot of information to you, and I expect you to learn it and to remember it. Maybe not all of the details, but I want you to take away some foundational knowledge from this class. But if you can't apply what you're learning, then really you're not going to be as successful in your job because innovation, creativity, problem solving are all important in uh, success in life. So notice that I'm going to put creativity right along with problem solving. Because what is problem solving but, be, but creatively trying to approach an issue that doesn't have an obvious answer? And then when we want to communicate, of course we need language. And all of the language centers are located um, in the cerebrum. And the processing of um, the senses is located. Uh, so I should put sensory processing. Information from vision is going to go to your occipital lobe, from taste is going to go to your parietal lobe, for smell is going to go to the temporal lobe, um, for touch goes to the parietal lobe. Did I already say that? Anyway, all of the senses are processed in the cerebrum. Also in the cerebrum, motor output or movement control. So especially from this area right here called the precentral gyrus at the back of the frontal lobe, that's your motor cortex and it's important in um, initiating movement. So deciding for voluntary movement is located in the cerebrum and also processing sensory information. It's divided into these four lobes. I'll just briefly put them here, the frontal lobe, uh, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe. The parietal lobe is paired, you've got two on either side, and same with the temporal, you've got two on either side. Okay, now the next region we'll talk about is the diencephalon, and that is so this is the corpus callosum. It divides the two halves of the brain. And then in here is, uh, kind of, I drew it way too big, but this would be looking into the lateral ventricle. So there's not brain tissue there. And then this is called the fornix, which is white matter that connects a lot of these areas here. So 
basically the diencephalon. It's just this little region here. But wait until you see all of the jobs that it has. <laughs> so the th this is uh, in green. And that word diencephalon means through the head. See how this is a sagittal section and we're looking right into the middle of that? It's core, um, give yourself a little space here because we're going to write something above that dot. You're going to have three dots like this. The central part in which the naming is centered off of is the thalamus. Thalamus means inner room. It's like the innermost room of your brain. And pretty much everything that occurs up here that needs to go down has to go through the thalamus, and all the sensory information going up has to go through the thalamus. So it's like a relay center. And then there's a structure above it, or about upon it, called the epithalamus. Epi means upon. And that's this part right here at the back, the epithalamus, and it makes melatonin. Melatonin uh, is produced in the dark and makes you sleepy. I've been reading about seasonal affective disorder, and one of the funny things I ran across was that taking melatonin in the late afternoon can actually help some people with seasonal affective disorder. And all I can come up with, because I thought, well, it's dark all the time. You're making lots of melatonin. But perhaps because it's dark all the time, the melatonin is not spiking at bedtime the way that it should. And so the person is a little bit drowsy all day, but never getting deep sleep. That's just one idea I'm throwing out there. Okay, and then the hypothalamus, hypo means below or under. And that is, um, very important in controlling the autonomic nervous system. In other words, it's going to control uh, involuntary stress response and um, things like rest and digest and many others, which we'll look at on another page. Okay, then we'll use pink for the brain stem. Divide it up like this. The bulge is called the pond, so you can make hatch marks across that. And then you can put some dots up here in what's called the midbrain. Then use your pink pen, we'll label all of that. That's the brain stem. The midbrain. It has some centers that are important in um, like vision reflexes and hearing reflexes and also um, some things that have to do with movement control like Parkinson's disease is associated with a problem in this area. And then the pons is hatched area, and then the medulla oblongata. So we can use this pen, go dot, 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 hatch marks, and then a clear open one for the medulla. And then the last part, the last region, the cerebellum. This is paired too. You have uh, two cerebellar hemispheres. And so in my sagittal section, you can only see one side of it here. But it's important in coordinating motor movements. It's really good at receiving sensory information about where your limbs are in space and what each of your skeletal muscles are doing and reporting that back up to the cerebral hemispheres. And then the cerebral hemispheres can uh, you know, send down what the request, the movement they want to make, but the cerebellum can coordinate that with where your limbs actually are to make it all happen. So it's like the best personal assistant you could ever have.
We also uh, believe that the cerebellum has some spatial skills role, like uh, somebody that's really good at puzzles or can see things in space and rotate them around. If you're really good at um, the mechanisms in organic chemistry or stereochemistry and really moving things around in your head, uh, your cerebellum has a lot to do with that. Let's highlight that in yellow. Okay, so if I were to ask you what are the four regions of the brain after looking at this page, you should be able to tell me pretty confidently, oh sure, I know that, the cerebrum, the diencephalon, the brain stem, and the cerebellum. If I were to ask you uh, what are the three parts of the diencephalon, you would be able to tell me the epithalamus, the thalamus, and the hypothalamus. And if I were to ask you what are the three parts of the brain stem, you'd be able to tell me the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata.